So today we continue on uh, this journey called Unexpected. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, next month, Dar mentioned, going to do a series. It's really on prayer. And I thought there are lots of different ways I could name this thing and describe this thing. That's what it's going to be about. But it's about how do we think about prayer with, a, with modern sensibilities? How do we make as much sense of it as we can, given the way we, what we know about the world? We know that uh, cosmology is different now than it was thousands of years ago when they thought God literally was up there. Well, God's not literally up there. God is everywhere all the time. So how does that affect how we pray? And that's where we're going. Uh, and I'm really excited to go there with you uh, and learn together uh, with that. Last week, I had uh, you guys uh, hear the whole story of Jonah and uh, encourage you guys to read it uh, throughout the week. How many of you read it at least one time through the week? Good job. All right. Uh, one crosswalker uh, told me this week that um, he read it several times and he was blown away that this thing is more than a children's story. Uh, he actually found out that what I said was right for once, which was <laughs> when we... <laughs> well, I guess you didn't, but I'm taking liberties. <laughs> That the more popped out, the more uh, he went uh, with it. And I had a couple others other than, other than Bob uh, tell me the same thing. So way to go on that. Today we're going to take a little bit different look uh, at this text and talk about its influences uh, in media of different forms, two different forms we're going to look at today, uh, although they both kind of uh, broad, broadened past one particular uh, genre. Um, can anybody remember the name of the story about... Uh, the marionette puppet that comes to life. Pinocchio. Pinocchio, right. Can anybody remember Pinocchio's father's name? Geppetto. I'm expecting the Italian over here to just nail this thing. I'm seeing silence over here, man. Maybe the questions are too easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, Pinocchio, how many of you have seen the Disney version of this? Okay, how many of you have seen the latest Disney version of this with Tom Hanks? Okay. How many of you seen uh, the latest Academy Award winning version of Pinocchio uh, from this past year? Highly recommend it. I think I thought it was really interesting, interesting twist on the whole story. Well, as you know, Pinocchio, if you're not familiar with it, it was written by a guy named uh, Carlo Collodi. Uh, maybe I'm getting that pronunciation right from Florence, uh, Tuscany. And uh, he wrote this in the 1800s and it was just a fable. Uh, that was translated around and people understood it. But if you haven't seen the movie and you don't know the story, it's a pretty cute little tale about uh, a guy who makes clocks. He's a wood crafter, carver, and he's known for his clocks, but he makes this little puppet and he calls it Pinocchio, uh, which in Italian goes back to an ancient form meaning pine nut. And so you've got this pine child and the, one of the reasons he wanted to make it is because he was so lonely. He wasn't able to have kids in his life, and this would become his companion. And in his desperation, he, he wishes upon the wishing star that shows up this particular night, and a fairy comes and brings Pinocchio to life. And also in the Disney version, uh, creates uh, his conscience. Anybody remember the name of the conscience? Jiminy Cricket, right? I actually have a Jiminy Cricket. I forgot to bring it today. Anyway, maybe next week. Uh, and uh, Jiminy Cricket is there to provide some strength uh, and character because poor old Pinocchio, uh, he doesn't know anything. He's just born and he's supposed to go to school. Knows He's supposed to figure out how to be a good boy. If he's a good boy, then maybe his wish will be granted that he'll be a real boy. And so uh, he's set off to school the next day. And wouldn't you know it, Pinocchio can't make it two steps without getting into trouble. And one step after another, all of a sudden he skips school. He gets bamboozled into uh, going to this uh, pleasure island where he kind of does some acting and stuff and makes some people a lot of money. And then he finds this space with other children and they're kind of sucking these kids in and they can kind of do whatever they want, right? So and it's, the Disney film was in 1940 and so reeks of 1940. And so the kids are getting to go trash places because vandalism's fun, of course, and uh, get to smoke cigars because that's what people do in the 1940s. And then they have as much beer as you want or whatever they were serving out of that keg. But what the kids didn't know is that the beer was laced with some kind of magic formula that turned the kids into donkeys. Now I, now I must pause. 
uh, because uh, I grew up in Kansas. I'm just Pete from Kansas. And every year in Garfield Elementary School, uh, sometime getting close to summer, we would get a day where we had an assembly where we all went into the multi-purpose room and we got to watch Pinocchio on the big screen. And that's a fun tale anyway, but what we were all so excited about too, and this happened without fail every year, is they did not use the term donkey for what these kids turned into. They used the term jackass. <laughs> and every time the word jackass was used, you would hear a couple hundred kids go, hee 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 hee, like this. Because in Kansas, everybody's a good Baptist and we don't say such words as jackass. So anyway, these kids drink the beer, they become jackasses because uh, there's a nefarious plot. There's people who own the salt mines and the salt mines always need donkeys to go in and help bring back the salt. And so these children uh, become jackasses, although they kind of already were because of the decisions that they made and they find themselves forever in the employ of the salt mines. Pinocchio is two ears in to being such a jackass when he escapes. And when he escapes, he finds out that his creator father, Geppetto, is gone. And he finds out where Geppetto is. He's gone into the sea to try to find his poor Pinocchio. And he's been swallowed up by the whale. Do you remember the name of the whale? Monstro. Very good. Not Maestro, but Monstro. And so this massive whale of a beast has swallowed him. Pinocchio, full of heroism, decides to truly be a good boy, jumps into the sea, goes to the far bottom that he can, and he finds a, a way to get into the mouth of Monstro where he finds his father. This wooden figure, the pine nut boy, uh, has a masterful idea about how to get out of the whale. Anybody remember how he does it? The wooden boy lights a fire. doesn't make a lot of sense, but he does it. <laughs> Somehow he does not get uh, caught on fire himself. And he gets, long story short, he gets sneezed out of the whale. He and his father and the father's cat and goldfish all survive. They land on a beach. Everybody's fine, but Pinocchio is not breathing anymore. And so they call out for help from the fairy godmother or whatever she is. And she comes and restores him. He's finally proven himself to be a good boy. And he becomes a real boy, not just a wooden marionette. I just saved you about an hour and a half. So you're welcome <clears throat> for that. Well, you can see some parallels here, obviously, with the story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah's this guy who, instead of going to school, he's supposed to go to Nineveh. Instead of going where he's supposed to go, he goes in the exact opposite direction. Uh, think if uh, Nineveh is Iraq and he's in Israel, uh, then he's choosing to go to Spain instead. Tarshish is one of these kind of nebulous names in the Bible. Scholars, even to this day, are debating about where Tarshish exactly is, or is it even a place? But for our reference, we're recognizing that he's going in the exact opposite direction, just like Pinocchio was making a terrible decision. <clears throat> Jonah, however, uh, did not have his nose grow an inch at a time with, <laughs> with every mistake. But things happen nonetheless. Uh, when Jonah made his decisions uh, to go the other way, <clears throat> it not only was problematic for him, it was distancing himself from what he was called to do, uh, but it was causing problems for other people. The sailors on this ship, on their way to Tarshish, uh, they found themselves in a terrible storm. And in their worldview, they believed that God was condemning them or judging them for something. And so they began to wonder what what do we need to do to survive? So they began offloading cargo, which was probably precious metals. Uh, the Tarshish seafarers were known for uh, their, long, uh, their long voyage uh, ships and primarily precious metals. So they're offloading everything. So they're losing money uh, in their system, and it still wasn't enough. So they're worshiping their gods as much as they can. None of them are, are Jewish, so they're not worshiping the Jewish God. They're worshiping whatever God they've uh, come to understand, and it's still not working. And they're still wondering, what do we got to do? So they find Jonah, who's snoring in the hold below. And they wake him up. This is sort of the irony here that we're supposed to see. Remember, this is kind of a folktale, kind of a fable. We're not supposed to read this as a literal story. 
So many things uh, within the story give us big nods from the Hebrew tradition that this is kind of a fable, but they struggle to figure out exactly what genre it is. So finally, they, they wake the only person who can possibly sleep because he's unconscious, right? He's asleep at his own wheel. He doesn't want to do what God wants him to do, and he's running the other way. He's asleep in his life. He's asleep in his faith. They wake him up. He explains to everybody, I'm the reason for your problem. God wanted me to go east, and I chose to go west. Throw me overboard, and it's all going to be fine. But the interesting hitch here is all of these pagan people on the ship who are not worshiping the Jewish one true God, so to speak, they're too faithful to kill them. <laughs> they're too good <laughs> to do it. So we have this, this contrast between the one who's supposed to be the epitome of a good Jewish man and all these non-Jewish people who are besting in goodness, Jonah. But they finally ask God for forgiveness and they throw him overboard. And what happens? Jonah expects to die. He's like, I'm fine. I would rather die than go tell the Ninevites, give them a warning that it's all coming down. And what does the text tell us? That God sends a whale, a great fish. Actually, in the Italian, it's a a great dogfish uh, to come and swallow up Jonah. He's there for three nights. Uh, he crashed somehow uh, in the dim light of the belly of a whale. He has the capacity to craft a beautiful poem. <laughs> it's a psalm in chapter two, talking about how God has rescued him and how grateful he is that God has rescued him. And once the morning breaks, what does God do? He causes uh, the, the whale to throw up, literally vomit Jonah back on the seashore of Israel. Jonah immediately uh, catches the drift, makes his way to Nineveh, and offers the worst sermon ever recorded in history, simply saying, in three days you're all going to die, and walks away. And they take it seriously. Again, a contrast. Unfaithful, hate-filled Jonah, who doesn't want anything to do with these people, makes his message as short as possible. Some of you are wishing I would do that right now, but I'm not. So he, <laughs> he gives the worst, shortest sermon ever because he doesn't care about these people. He doesn't want God to be graceful with them. He's worried that God will be graceful with them. And once they have a warning, maybe they'll turn it around. And they do. They turn out to be more faithful than Jonah, the one who's supposed to be the prophet, the one who's supposed to be the exemplar. Even to the point, if you remember last week, the ruler says, I want everybody to show how mournful you are and dress in sackcloth and ashes. I even want you to dress your animals in sackcloth and ashes. We're, we're supposed to laugh out loud at the scene of this. Cattle, goats, sheep, dogs, cats, goldfish, all dressed in sackcloth and ashes. It's a ridiculous scene to say these people are so serious uh, in their faithfulness in contrast to poor Jonah. The whole story is... Uh, an obvious joke. It's supposed to make us laugh and look at this idiot character of Jonah. He goes up on the hill to catch the whole scene, hoping that it's all going to fry. And instead, God creates this great plant to give him shade. Jonah's so grateful for God's grace. So now he can watch in comfort as Nineveh is destroyed, he hopes. But overnight, God uh, sends a worm to devour it and brings a bold sun the next day. And instead of just saying, oh, well, that's the way it goes, Jonah gets mad at God all over again that he lost his plant. And God holds him accountable and says, look, you're more upset about this stupid plant than all those people in Nineveh, one of the great cities of the world. What is wrong with you? And that's how the story ends, basically. So we see that just as with the story of Pinocchio, where his decisions do not affect him alone. They, they bring other people into the mess, and other people are having to deal with that. Same with Jonah. He makes his mistakes, but it's not just he that's affected. And so what I want to tell you is, is that even though Pinocchio and Jonah, even though these may not be historically, factually accurate uh, tales, they are true stories nonetheless, because they speak a truth, don't they? Because it was re as we reflect on both of these, we recognize that when we make mistakes, we think that our mistake, whatever that might be, 
uh, just not being in touch with our emotions and maybe having our grumpiness bleed out into everybody around us, to not taking care of our side of the street on things, to much more egregious things, the hatred in our heart and how that might be expressed in the world. We think, hey, it's only going to hurt me, but we must stop and just say, that's never the case. Uh, our junk uh, affects everybody around us to varying degrees. Pinocchio, Jonah, every story of every human being agrees. So Pinocchio is one of these that has obvious connections to the story of Jonah. But there's another one too. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's called Moby Dick. Familiar with that one? Now this one, interestingly, by Melville, um, actually was very loosely based on an actual tale of whalers uh, who were out on the high seas sometime in the middle 1800s and faced a whale so devious and great that the entire expedition uh, perished, including the ship. And he took that piece of information, that bit of historical truth, and crafted this tale about this Captain Ahab uh, who is com in command of the Pequod, and he's getting these folks off the eastern seaboard in the middle of winter to go and join him. His first mate, Starbuck, uh, is going to take them out, and their hope is, everybody in the crew anyway thinks, to kill a bunch of whales, get their blubber so that they can come back and sell it. So it's capitalism at its best right here. And so you got a whole crew that are ready, but can anybody tell me uh, the first the first three words of the book Moby Dick? Anybody know those? Call me Ishmael. Call me Ishmael who become, thank you, Norman. Congratulations for Norman. Well done. All right. <laughs> Call me Ishmael. So right away, the author is giving us a big hint. This Ishmael has a difficult story that Carol Sturley will go through in her survey of the Old Testament. He becomes uh, a stepchild of Abraham and Sarah. He's a slave. He's let go when he's about 14, 15 years old, to fend for himself, he and his mother, put out into the desert with just a couple bottles of water. This is Ishmael. Anybody, and by the way, back in those days, the Bible was like one of the most read books that most people were familiar with. Everybody immediately knew this Ishmael is a slave and he may not even know it yet. And that's exactly what happened. In this case, Captain Ahab who uh, only had one leg because Moby Dick bit off the other one. He has his own agenda. He doesn't really care about making money. He wants to seek out and kill Moby Dick, this giant, whiter than white whale. He passes up a school of whales where they could have filled their cargo load and made a fortune, but instead he continues on. I don't want to spoil anything. But just so you know, <laughs> by the end of the story, Ishmael is the lone survivor. Uh, and the ship is gone. The crew is gone. All the boats are gone. Only Ishmael survives so that the story can be retold. Well, when we hear this story about uh, this grand whale uh, that ends up swallowing up um, you know, several different men, including Captain Ahab at the very end, Obviously, we can see the connection with Jonah. And even in the early chapters of Moby Dick, uh, there's even a sermon given by the local town preacher. And what is he preaching about? Jonah and the whale. So this whole thing, we're getting set up in this. When we think about this story of Moby Dick, uh, what I want to tell you is that even though uh, it is a masterpiece of American literature and serves as um, kind of an encyclopedia of understanding whaling ships of its time. That's why it's 1,500 pages. He spends so much time talking about the intricacies of knots and ropes and stat and masts and the hull and all this stuff and who comes from where and all this. If anybody just wanted to read it and read a good story, it's a great book. It's a classic. But Melville wasn't just wanting to write about a bunch of whalers going to seek out this massive beast. Melville lived in the 1800s. By the time he wrote this, he, among other scholars and 
people who had a larger view of the world were deeply disturbed by what they were seeing in the world. He had to be careful with what he said because what he wanted to say and what he recognized was happening in America at that time was so divisive, even within his own family, that if he actually just said it straight out, this is what I'm seeing as a problem and we got to do something about this because this is wrong, he probably never would have sold a book and probably would have potentially lost his life. His father-in-law, his father-in-law, was a deep South sympathizer. So if he dare said anything that had to do with racial inequality, the damage of slavery, what was happening in the deep South after deconstruction failed, he would lose the support of his primary purse string. So what does he do? He writes a tale about a captain that is so obsessed with this one thing. That's all he can think about. Do you ever see Lord of the Rings, any of those movies, or read those massive books? This is the ring, right? The whale is the ring that he can't get off his mind, and it's literally driving him crazy. But what else is going on? What is uh, Ahab, what, what is Melville trying to say? What is he challenging here? Well, it just so happens that a new uh, member here at Crosswalk, um, Kim uh, Hester Williams is a professor at Sonoma State University, and she teaches uh, as part of her literature course up there for both undergraduate and graduate students. She teaches Moby Dick. And so I talked to her this week and asked her, hey, you know, just off the top of your head, what are the major take-home points uh, that academics are saying and that students should be learning about the point of Moby Dick? Is it it just a whale of a tail or what? And she says, oh, no. Melville was taking direct shot at some of the major problems of American culture in the late 1800s, including runaway capitalism, which was very dangerous then and now because capitalism as a way of economic thinking has benefited many in the world, but unchecked, it also has the capacity to do great horror in the world. The great American sin of American slavery is the shining example of such a thing. That for a dollar, for for capital gains literally, we're willing to do anything. And even the church colluded with the plan. Endorsing uh, the kind of slavery that we had here in the United States uh, as if God was ordaining it. This was preached in pulpits It was used to support the move for centuries. So one of the things that he was going against was capitalism itself. Unchecked capitalism. Greed, if you will. Another thing he was going after, obviously, had to do with racial injustice because he could see that that was crystal clear. And a host of other things. The main thing I want you to get out of that is I'm not trying to give you an overview or a lecture on Moby Dick. I'm not qualified to do that. But what I want to just point out is that you have this massive book about a whale that's really not about a whale. It's not about what the story appears to be. The loose themes are related, of course. This guy's driven mad by his obsession, and it calls into question our American culture. What are we obsessed with? And to what lengths will we go to get the ring, to get the whale, to get that which we are obsessed with? But I want you to hold on to that because when we look at Jonah, we have to ask the same thing. In fact, Jonah is an excellent example of this same kind of phenomenon. We don't know who wrote the book of Jonah. Even though, like I said last week, uh, it's sort of credited to a guy named Jonah of Amittai who lived in the 8th century before Jesus was born. Uh, Probably that was just a way to ground the story in some historical figure and was not really about this particular guy. The reason why I think the story was anonymous as it was read uh, before uh, townsfolks uh, in the central squares of different villages is because it was extremely dangerous. The story of Jonah would get the author killed because Jonah is challenging the audience to see themselves. 
Jonah is about hatred. Jonah is about a guy who is saying with his mouth that he has the one true God and is in relationship with the one true God, and yet nothing about his character, nothing about his ideology, nothing about his behavior seems to reflect that God at all. People would simply laugh out loud when they would hear this story because it's meant to be a comedy. But then at the very end of the story, and as whoever the town crier was that would walk away from that story, people are left to think, was this just about a guy uh, who got swallowed up by a whale? Or is this telling us something about us? Jonah represented Israel as a whole. And as a whole, Israel, because of what they'd been through, it makes sense, was filled with hatred toward the people of Nineveh and all those who had oppressed them for hundreds and hundreds of years. Beginning from 800-ish B.C. all the way through, well, (laughs) all the way through the time of Jesus and beyond as the Roman Empire came and took over. Israel was not their own again until a little over a century ago or a little more than that. There was bitterness on their part toward their oppressors. And in truth, if they had heard wind uh, that God wanted any good thing for anybody outside their borders who may represent the oppressor, there would be backlash. How dare you suggest anything good for those people who did those things? Is that understandable? You know, this was still a reality in the time of Jesus. Jesus' first sermon, as you know, he goes back to his hometown in Nazareth. He's got a little bit of renown. Uh, He's been around a little bit. People are talking about his insight and all this. He's about 30-ish years old, maybe 34. He goes back and preaches in his own synagogue. He decides what text he wants to read. And the text he chooses to read uh, has to do Uh, with looking out for those uh, who have really took it on the chin. Uh, He uses flowery language, poetic language for it, but people have been abused, the blind, the oppressed, the imprisoned. He's there to announce their freedom. Everybody loves that. Standing ovation. But then he goes on because he recognizes that they haven't quite understood the point. And he goes on and says, you know what? In the time of Elijah, there were a whole lot of people who really needed help in Israel. But Elijah chose to go to the north and take care of people up there. And then he told another story on along the same vein. Immediately, the crowd started to get the idea that Jesus was suggesting that God was not just about their team, but actually was for all people everywhere. And do you remember the crowd's reaction to that? This is their, this is their local synagogue. This is their hometown boy. And what do they do with their hometown boy? They take him to the edge of the town and hope to push him off a cliff so that that will be the last sermon ever coming out of Jesus' mouth. This stuff was hanging around for hundreds of years. It kind of makes you wonder, just as an aside, in our own country with our own issues, I wonder how long it takes for deeply rooted issues to work themselves out in a culture. You're talking 800 years for that story. Our country has only been around for a few hundred years. I wonder if some of the difficult things from our country's past might still be with us, even if we don't think so. Well, this also gets interesting because uh, when Jesus is teaching, he's starting to gain renown. Not only is he a profound teacher and has interesting insight in interpreting uh, Old Testament law and so forth, uh, but he also has this capacity to heal. We're not exactly sure how that all worked out. Uh, Sometimes, you know, they're what they would call demon-possessed people. That could be people struggling with mental illness of some kind. And whatever Jesus was doing in exchange with them, that somehow it was having an effect on them and their symptoms went away. Other times, uh, they flat out called it a miracle, some of the things that he did. I don't doubt some of the miracles. Some of them are so 
far-fetched and late in time, later editions that we need to think about them. But, but certainly there were some that we just look at and say, well, I don't know how that happened, but something happened there. And enough people believe that he was what they called a magician that the, that the word stuck. But the problem is in antiquity, the religious leaders, that was not satisfying enough. To be a real deal person of God, they really wanted incontrovertible proof that this person was really anointed from God. And so the Jewish leadership, not the whole Jewish population of themselves, but the leadership, the ones who were in the game, who were threatened by the power of Jesus and his growing authority, especially as he was challenging their interpretation, they finally cornered him and they said, we want you to give us an irrefutable sign that you are the one that you say you are, that God is truly with you. And Jesus rips into him for a minute and says, I can't believe what you guys are asking me to do. Now, in all fairness, the way that the Pharisees and the leaders of Judaism at that time, the way they were framing it was, well, there are a lot of ma magicians floating around, and there were. Uh, there were people who had all kinds of ways. Some of them were flat out uh, snake oil salespeople, you know, kind of a thing. Some of them had some kind of legit gifts that somehow was doing the same thing. So for them to hear that Jesus was just a magician, eh, dime a dozen. So they wanted to know. And so they're putting the test on Jesus. Show us a sign uh, that only God could do. And you know what Jesus' response is? He says, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Because the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days and then rise again. That's Matthew's rendition of it. Now, Matthew, the gospel, was written decades after Jesus' life and ministry. For all the contemporaries who heard the, the writings of Matthew by that time that it was written, uh, none of them ever knew the physical Jesus. He was long gone. The only thing they'd experienced was the Christ, which is not Jesus' last name, <laughs> but is this other experience of God that is bigger than the man. that he, The man embodied, certainly, but bigger than that. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, you ever wonder why Jesus never looked like Jesus? And they always wondered, is that Jesus? It's because we're supposed to think bigger than the man. For those ancient people who never knew Jesus 30, 40, 50 years after, for them, the big thing was the presence of Christ, the resurrected thing, that this one who the people of God, the, the leadership of God, put in the ground, God said, I'm going to raise you back up to a new expression of life. And those who experienced that expression became that new Christian community. So when Jesus says, the only sign I'm going to give you is a sign of Jonah, it's really a complex statement that he's making. One is the obvious thing that I just shared with you, but the, the part that gets a little fuzzy is Jesus was no Jonah Remember, Jonah's character didn't give a rip about people. Uh, Jonah didn't want anything to do with anybody except his Jewish comrades and look, or look for their best interests and assume that that was God's MO as well. Well, that's not Jesus. Jesus was in trouble because he was inclusive and wanting more and more people to know of the love of God. And the life was theirs to, to be old and enjoy. Uh, that there was a whole different way of thinking about absolutely everything. That's expansive and life-giving and graceful and freeing. So how do we understand the Jonah character? Well, if we think about the original book of Jonah, we recognize that Jonah ended up getting thrown out of that ship, off that ship, into the sea, uh, into the belly of the well, because of the sinfulness, the hard-heartedness of ancient Israel. And in a sense, no. In reality, it was the hard-heartedness of the Jewish leaders who were threatened at that time who put Jesus in the same place. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Jesus is not Jonah, but the cause that got Jonah thrown off the ship and into the belly of the well is the same. The Jewish leadership and their hatred colluded with Roman authorities to make sure to shut this guy up for good. 
it makes us wonder. As we think about all these different ways of thinking about this folk tale, this, this myth, uh, this fairy tale, if somebody came and read it to us today, it is a masterpiece. What would the anonymous authors of Jonah hope the audience would take away? Much like Melville today. I wonder if he could come back and have a book study with us. What would his hopes be for contemporary Americans in response to his work? What would Americans need to hear from the book of Jonah about who we are and what we are about? It would bring to mind some fairly obvious things that make us all very uncomfortable, which is why Jonah is a comedy. It's meant to make us laugh because the ridiculousness of the particulars of the story catch us off guard. A guy running in the other direction, a guy thrown out to sea, swallowed by a whale. We're too busy laughing and smiling at the ridiculousness of this story to realize what is being said the lengths that people will go to maintain their status quo. I wonder, is, is, there, is there any relevance anymore, the book of Jonah, to our present day culture? Is there any divisiveness in our country? Is there any greed in our society? Is there any evidence of bias or prejudice from one people group to another in our land? Is there any unfair or unjust treatment of others in our borders or outside of them? Now, uh, Richard Rohr, who I read just about every day, uh, he is a friar, a Franciscan friar. And uh, today he launched a series on uh, prophets and the role of prophecy in antiquity and really still today. A lot of times we get the idea that prophets were future tellers, uh, that they were able to figure out what was going to happen. And that was one of the ways you knew that they were legit, is they, they said the winning lottery for $1.6 is going to be blah, 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 and they nailed it, and so truly the one. But that's really not what prophets were about. Prophets were seers, and they were futurists, and they were communicators to the general populace. The way Rohr puts it is a really beautiful way that the prophets were so grounded in their spirituality and their vision of what God wanted to do, that they recognize in our vernacular the shalom of God, the goodness of God that God wants to bring into the whole world for all people. And when they see this beautiful vision of what it looks like when everything and everyone and the planet itself is in harmony together, working together as it should in this beautiful creation, when they see what that looks like, and then they look at their present culture, they recognize the differences, and the differences that they see, they simply call out. So if we see in this grand vision of God, complete equity, regardless of who people are, how they think, where they come from, skin tone, sexual orientation, fill in the blank, whatever divides us, and they recognize that inclusive here, here we've got major differences with that. What is a prophet to do? A prophet's going to say, folks, we got a problem. We got a problem just like Jonah had a problem. He didn't want to see it. He ran the other way. But I got to tell you that I've seen what God wants to do in the world and what we've had here is a far cry from it. So what are you going to do about it? That's how a prophet would work. A seer of the vision of the beauty and the harmony that God desires to see happen here and now. And where there's discrepancy, call it out. So my question for you as our contemporary audience, as you reflect on your own journey, as you reflect on this story, what would the prophets be calling out today? For you as an individual, before you... Excuse yourself and think about all those people out there doing all those terrible things. <laughs> you as a person, is there anything in you that the prophet would say, hey, uh, what about this? 
It may be an attitude. It may be a behavior. What about this? And hear the tone of the prophet, even in the book of Jonah. Uh, you know, the visage of God is of one who is graceful, not punitive, but redemptive. One who's wanting to restore again and again and again. That's, that's, the, that's what Jesus came to proclaim in every possible way. Not punitive, not I'm going to beat the snot out of you until you get this, but your life, your decisions, your attitude, your things that are incongruent with what God is trying to do in the world are catching up with you and causing you and probably others pain. Can you see? Can you hear that I want to heal? Can you hear that there's another way? Will you consider it? What is the prophet saying to you today on a personal level? And expand it out. This is where it gets easier and easier. When we think about family systems, what are we seeing in the family systems that we were born into, that we are in, that we're helping create now? What are we seeing in that that maybe we need to learn from the vision of God from the prophets to say, hey, see this? Because this needs to change. Culturally, so many things that we know we need to work on that go across any Republican or Democratic line. Because the prophets of old didn't even know there were Republicans and Democrats to complain about, right? They don't care. They don't care. The kingdom of God, as Jesus called it, the kingdom of heaven, same thing. The shalom that God is wanting to bring into the world does not care about your political affiliation. The prophets do not care about your political affiliation because the prophets only care about bringing the shalom of God, which they have seen, and bringing it into the here and now. Because that is God's desire. That is what God's winds are always blowing into. That is what God is wooing us toward at all times. And at times, that wooing, that invitation for Democrats who are here today, it's going to piss you off because it's going to touch a nerve and say, well, I don't know about that. But the prophet is saying, this is shalom, that is not. And at other times, some of you Republicans who might be here today will get pissed off because the prophet is saying, I'm seeing shalom here and it's not there and it needs to change. Wouldn't it be an incredible thing if we could think less and less about Republicans and Democrats in our divisive culture and think more and more about the shalom that God is wanting to bring into the world and is inviting us to be a part of it. Because that is what's happening. Before we uh, say the Lord's Prayer together, I want to spend a time just in quiet. And then as best as you can from, a, from afar, we'll say this. So if you join me just in a brief meditation, close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. Take a couple deep breaths just to kind of cleanse you. Roll your shoulders because I probably ticked you off in one way or another. Just try to center into this space. You are the hearers of the Jonah story today, which was so much more than a whale of a tail unexpected, unexpected realities and challenges. I'm simply asking you this morning to dial into what question, what thing would the prophet be saying to you? What needs to be seen? It may be a nudge that you have when I was talking about your personal life. It may be an insight to the ridiculousness of our political environment. And when we're too married to it, we do the kingdom of God a disservice. How is God wooing you now? What might your next step be if you were to say yes to this invitation to being an agent 
of shalom, of love, of peace, of harmony. Is there anything preventing you from saying yes to the invitation? It is scary. It's a vulnerable feeling. That doesn't make it wrong. So Spirit of God, Spirit of love, love incarnate, our ground of being, you who are as close as our next breath and, and in the ever-expanding galaxies, you who are the force of life, the energy that connects us, you are the one who calls us all together, who is our life breath. You are now and you are forever. You are trustworthy and good, otherwise creation simply wouldn't continue to exist. And you are inviting us into this creative option, this creative dream, vision, to see ourselves in Jonah, to ask ourselves what needs to change for the good of not just us, but everyone and everything. Help us take one step at a time, Spirit of God that we might become more whole as we seek to make the whole world and all its people and all its plants and all its waters and all its animals more whole too. To that end, uh, we open our eyes and for those of you who can read the screen, we choose to dare to utter this rendition of the Lord's Prayer together. Let's say it together. Our loving, supportive Holy Abba, who are here and everywhere. May your divine commonwealth come. May your will be done through us. We are grateful for the gift of food and work for all to eat their fill. May we work for a world where mutual grace and respect abound, where well-being and deep peace thrive. Strengthen us for the work to which we are called. Amen. May it be so. Thank you so much for being here today. We got out pretty early. Not bad. All right. That's why you're clapping. Hey, we're going to take, uh, yeah, interplay is going to happen uh, soon in the gym. If I can get anybody helping clear the tables and chairs, that would be deeply appreciated. Otherwise, have a great week, and we go even deeper next week in the book of Jonah, if you can imagine that.